Welcome to Talking Out Your Glass. I'm Sean Wagoner. In the process of inspiring others to try glass, Fritz Dreisbach began studying and reinventing historic shapes in glass with his personal brand of irony, humor, and fun. Above all, he tried to capture the fluid nature of his medium in homage to the molten material used to create the work. Children's toys and games, funk art, especially ceramics, and 1960s comics all inform and inspire Dreisbach's artwork. His influences include and are as diverse as Jackson Pollock, Klaus Oldenburg, Robert Arneson, Clayton Bailey, Fred Bauer, and R. Crumb. Dreisbach now lives on Whidbey Island and works out of his glass studio in Freeland, Washington, creating a new series of wheel-carved and cameo-cut sculpture. In addition, he continues to explore his large blown works, known as mongos, and produces playful goblets, trick glasses, and toy vehicles. Part two of my interview with Fritz Dreisbach begins with the artist discussing how humor is successfully incorporated into his art. From the 1960s until now, you've made whimsical glass pieces with a sense of humor, including alligators, your hamburger helicopters, your very famous farm. Talk about your philosophy behind humorous work in glass. I was looking, as were most of the, the glass people, I was looking at what was happening in the ceramics world, the world of ceramics. And one of the features that that I thought was was totally fascinating and attracted me was the funk ceramics of the West Coast of, of the California funk ceramic movement. And it spread not only ceramics, but it also spread to other other areas, other materials as well. The, the jewelry people and the metals people, small metals picked up on it also. But Having things that were like visual puns seemed a really clever way that you could show off all your tricks and get a good laugh all at the same time. That's that's really how it started. And I, one of the, the areas that, that I jumped on and, and continued to work with for a long, long time and still occasionally uh, do in workshops, demos, are children's toys, toys that, that that could have been under the Christmas tree. And when the Louisville Art Museum people invited me to um, send a piece to the to their uh, children's fantasy show, I thought, boy, I died and gone to heaven here. This is this is right up my alley. And so my students and I started making all the little parts that would be similar to a farm set that you might find under the Christmas tree. And when you open the boxes up, there'd be the the fence and the house and the barn and the wishing well and all those things and the cows and the horses and the pigs and the chickens and so on (laughs) and the pickup truck and the tractor. <laughs> and you know, I, I'm laughing right now. You see what I'm saying? It, it's funny. It, it, to <laughs> me, it's still very humorous. And, and to make those things out of white milk glass, I oh, I made this decision at first just to make a few toys for these kids for their exhibition in Kentucky, and then I, it grew to the point that we ended up completing a pretty much an entire farm set. And when we were living in Southern Ohio and, and I was teaching at o, o, Ohio University again, another later time. And we would drive around in the country, my students and I, we'd drive around in the countryside and we'd look over at these various farms and, we'd, oh, look, there's a, whatchamacallit, we don't have one of those yet. And we'd race back to the glass studio and blow one until we finally had this complete... What, what we call pretty much a complete farm set. I, I don't know. <laughs> the Corning Museum um, counted how many pieces are in it. I think it was tw- like 1,200 pieces or some, some ridiculous huge number. But it, but it does have a lot of parts. Yeah, and, and it was a lot of fun. And it was all made with white milk glass. That was the decision. 
that that I had to deal with because uh, that trying to color each one the the original or the correct colors was going to be another science project you know, on top of a huge art project, and I just decided to uh, make only one color, and milk glass seemed like the way to go. In 1968, you began to research and recreate historical examples of trick glasses dating back to the 17th and 18th century. Describe some of these works and why they intrigued you. My very first teaching job after graduating from Madison, Wisconsin, with the MFA degree, was at the Toledo Museum School of Design. It was actually a joint uh, employment uh, with the museum and with uh, Toledo University. It turned out the museum was the art department for the university. So I was paid as a college professor and also as a, or instructor and also as a, a museum instructor. This was a great opportunity for me to go study the, the history of glass because that museum's collection is gigantic and, and very inclusive. I would go in the museum, look at pieces of glass, and then come out and try to make them in the studio. And I would do those as demos then for the students so that they could understand how things were done and how they were made in the, in the older times. And one of the times I was in the museum looking at a goblet that was very interesting to me because it had a lot of uh, frou-frou, a lot of doodah on the, on the outside of it, uh, on the stem especially, but also up onto the bowl and down on the stem. And then I noticed there was a hole. In it. And the hole went clear into the uh, interior of the stem, of the hollow stem. Well, that meant that if you poured a liquid into the cup of that goblet, it would run down into the stem and out that hole. And it would just come pouring out. And I thought, well, that's dumb. Why would anybody do that? And I examined it to make sure it wasn't broken. No, it was completely smooth and fire polished. So it was a very purposeful hole that was placed there for a reason that eluded me for a while. So I got back on my research wagon and started uh, asking questions and reading uh, books and articles. And it turns out there is a group of glasses, a very small group of glasses that are called joke glasses or trick glasses or surprise glasses that have been made from pretty much from the 17th century till the 19th century, and mostly in Northern Europe, but occasionally in other countries as well, to um, surprise and embarrass people uh, because they make funny noises, they gurgle, um, they sometimes splash you. If you, if you know the, uh, the classic horn or boot that is used in fraternity uh, rituals where the if you know the secret you can drink out of it without getting a lot of the beer splashed on your person but if you don't know this the the trick then then you end up getting drenched and everybody laughs at you do you know the trick yeah i do are you going to share it with tell. us i can't tell <laughs> So, Come on, uh, people would tune in just to learn yeah. the, the trick of the boot glass. Right. Okay. Well, <laughs> we'll do that as a separate uh, fundraiser. Okay. Or maybe that'll be in your book because you're writing a book about these glasses, yeah. right? Yeah, I am. And it will be, it, it, the hints will be there, very strong hints will be there how to do it. Okay. And, so, and then, and then uh, probably the most interesting of all of those trick glasses I found much later uh, so I started making these things and enjoying make I enjoyed making them and the museum personnel the the curators and and directors and so on of various museums that had trick glasses in their collections were interested to see them work because uh, when there's when a trick glass is sitting on the shelf it doesn't, doesn't do anything you have to put the liquid in and you have to do it the right way and then you get to see what the trick is. But it's hard for many people to visualize how the trick might occur, how, how it works, the, the physics, the, the dynamics of it. And, and it's especially true of the ones that are called greedy cups or Pythagoras cups. 
And those have an internal plumbing apparatus that allows you to put a small amount of liquid in and drink quite comfortably. But if you put too much in, if you get too greedy and you put too much liquid in, it starts peeing on you or dumping the, the liquid out. <laughs> a flushing toilet. Those are the most fascinating, and they're also the most fun to do as a demo and then perform with it uh, the next day when they come out of the annealer. When and where will the book be available? I'm not sure about the when, um, and always you'll be able to find it by going on to my, when it is published, uh, by going to my website, which is just my name, one word, fritzdreisbach.com. Okay. And you can always check on things, see what, what's happening there. Okay. And, uh, but the when, it, it could be a year or so from now. So you mentioned earlier that you were always very intrigued by vessels. And throughout your career, you created several very important ceremonial vessels of historical significance. Can you talk a little bit about those? The Toledo Museum was bragging about their brand new glass studio that, that was just finished at the end of 1969. And so in 1970, the spring of 1970, they held a workshop to, to bring a bunch of the glass artists that wanted to come to Toledo to study for a week and work with me at the, at the new museum's studio, at the museum's new studio, and also uh, go out to Nick's and, and work. And so when he did this demo for the students out at his studio, he asked me to help him. Now, this was very unusual because... Mm, Almost everything that Nick made, he did by himself. This was a, something that he believed in. He wanted to be able to say that he made everything himself rather than having a helper, which kind of uh, reminded him, I think, of factory work where the various people had skills, certain skill sets, and they would each perform those duties. But no one person was making each piece of glass. And he wanted to make sure that everybody understood that he was making them. But this time he asked me to help. So I did. I helped him. And uh, we made a goblet. He designed it. And uh, all I did was just make the parts that he instructed and, and it was made with three bubbles and put together into a goblet for him. And it was a very unusual opportunity for the students to see him work that way. And was I was thrilled to be asked to be the person to help. When it came out of the annealing oven the next day, he just handed it to me, and I thought, wow, that's weird. He, he doesn't give pieces away like that. And then later I thought, wow, well, you know, I'll bet he doesn't consider that to be his piece because I was involved in it, so he can't really say that he made it all by himself. So I had made a poster to celebrate that, uh, that workshop called Get It All Together Again, where they brought Harvey and Nick and, and Harvey Leafgreen together in Toledo's new studio. So I did an engraving based on that poster, the design of the poster. And I uh, used a diamond stylus and I scratched on the glass. And that was really, I think, the first engraving that I, I did on glass. I had already been engraving on copper and printing uh, the engravings with ink and paper on paper while I was a student at Iowa City, but I had never tried to engrave on the glass. But I'd seen lots and lots of photographs and lots and lots of pieces in museums all over the world that had glass you know, with engravings on them as decoration. So I made one and I thought, and I liked it a lot. And um, so I gave it back to Nick. And he kept it. He loved it. He kept it all of his life. And when he died, his wife, Libby, very kindly gave it back to me. So I get to keep that piece. I still have it. It's here on the on the uh, on, on top of the fireplace on the mantle. And it's a very, very special piece. But it was also this first step at engraving ceremonial objects. And then later that led to the 1972 10th anniversary goblet that I made for an exhibition that was held in New York. 
and was later then purchased from that exhibit, purchased by the Toledo Museum, called the 10th anniversary of the contemporary of the Toledo workshops, which really, I think, say that that's, I say that that's when uh, the contemporary glass activity started. Studio Glass began in March of 62 in Toledo, Ohio, in their little tiny garage out, out behind the museum, where those first few students got together with Nick Lavino, but got together with Harvey, and then also it included Nick Lavino, and, and Harvey Leafgreen showed up on the last day. It's a very famous story that has been told many, many times. I engraved that one uh, using both the flex shaft grinder and the diamond stylus. I graduated <laughs> to the to the uh, more usable tool for for writing on glass or engraving on glass. And it was imagery from that first workshop. But it also expanded to um, include many of the schools that had come had grown up out of that first exposure. And in those first 10 years, there, we had gone from only one school, Madison, to, and then, and then 64, there were three schools or four schools, including Iowa and uh, San Jose, California, and Berkeley, California, and uh, a few others. And then uh, by, by 1970, there were probably 100 schools, and uh, I, they're listed on that, on that goblet. What about your Paoli goblet from 1975? In 75, I was doing a workshop circuit. Those workshops that we talked about earlier, those were so important in, in terms of spreading the gospel from uh, one place to another and from one artist to, a, to all the other artists. And I was doing workshop sequence with Rob Levin, my, who was my TA at Ohio. And uh, he and I were traveling out east and my truck was broken into and our his tools glass blowing tools and my glass blowing tools were stolen out of the truck so we had to finish uh, and we had two or two more schools to go to so we had to finish the the circuit by borrowing tools from the students wherever we were which was you know a little bit restricting but not not horrible anyhow when David Jacobs, the owner of Paoli Clay Company, which supplied all of the glass, early glass people with tools and equipment and the 475 marbles, by the way, John's Vanville marbles from, that Nick developed, uh, he sold equipment to potters and also glass people. And when he found out that, that our tools were stolen, uh, we were at the Glass Art Society conference in, in uh, Toledo in 75, and he just gra got the two of us, Rob and Levin and myself, together. And he brought us back behind his truck, and he said, opened up the, his toolbox where he was selling tools. And he said, just take any tool you need so you can keep blowing. And we were so blown away with that generous, generous offer that the first, we decided the first thing we were going to do when we got home to Athens, Ohio, w would be to blow a thank you note to give to David Jacobs. And we made the Paoli goblet. And it's not engraved, but it's still a ceremonial piece. And in fact, he uses a photograph of that still to this day on his business card as a, that's his, uh, that's his uh, logo as it were. We lost David, he died about uh, 10 years ago, unfortunately, but uh, his family still operates the place. And I go and visit once in a while when I'm in Madison. I was there, Audrey Handler took me there a couple of years ago and they're still using that, that business card. And it was a, it was a, a really great feeling I always thought that Corning Museum was jealous of the fact that Toledo got the 10th anniversary and they wanted one. <laughs>
And that, in fact, uh, Suzanne France, when she was curator there uh, in Corning, asked me to make one. And I said, no, Suzanne, I don't really want to do that. I, I, I've already done the commemorative thing, that, that 10th anniversary, and I don't really see how I can make another one. So she just bided her time, and um, then the Corning Museum offered me a Rakow Award in 1992. Talked about it, and in 93 it became the reality. Uh, but it was to celebrate the 30th anniversary, so I had to do it because I couldn't say no to to uh, Leonard and uh, Juliet uh, Rakow. There were big supporters of this, of, of all the glass, and especially the Corning Museum. And uh, they set this up so that every year Corning could give a, an award to an artist, and, and then they get to keep the piece for their collection. It's a very, very good idea, wonderful idea. So I said, yes, I, I'll do it. So then I decided, well, if you're going to do it, you better do something better, and you better do something different than you did on the 10th. So I enrolled in a class to study glass engraving with Yurji Hartseva from the Czech Republic at Pilchuk that summer of 94. And then fin finally finished the piece um, that fall and delivered it for their big ceremony. It's called the, uh, the Glass Seminar. It's every fall in Corning. And I was made a speaker for that and they unveiled literally unveiled my piece during the seminar uh, the way the museum used to be set up there was a circle there was in the center of the of the museum was the library which is kind of a nice statement surrounding the library was a hallway a wide hallway that went all the way around and there were 10 plinths 10 pedestals, covered pedestals, that were each of them had a major piece of glass from their collection. And if you just came for a short visit, you could whip around and see those 10 plinths and then get back in your car and get on the highway. But if something uh, was interesting and attractive to you, then you could turn left at any of those 10 and go into a room where there were more pieces of that type and that time period. It's really cool. And then my chalice, my pokal, as I called it, was the 10th one. For a whole year, I represented the 20th century. And that was a big, big wow. <laughs> <laughs> but when we got there to, to before the ceremony, um, it was covered. It was covered in a, a black velvet shroud with a gold braid. My mother was furious because she couldn't see it. She was dying to see it. And uh, she wanted to look under the, the shroud. I wouldn't let her open it up. <laughs> I said, you have to wait just like everybody else, Mom. <laughs> so I the whole thing. And then, then, of course, it became part of the museum's collection that day. And um, But I had made a backup piece. And uh, I still have that today and I gave that to my mom to um, apologize to her for the not letting her see the uh, the real thing right away when she first got to Corning for the ceremony yeah that was that was cool your mongos are massive ornate expressions of liquid fluid glass and optical refractions you made those from 1979 to 2008 um, talk about that work. Are they an homage to the material you work with? Yes, they are. I think almost everything I do is is an homage to to the glass stuff, the goo, the hot goo. But the mangos made a very strong statement um, for the the qualities of glass that that uh, are very attractive to me. That the, the the fluidity, the massiveness, the the refractions, the colored uh, developments uh, of, of transparency and, and opacity and translucency and so on, all of those things. And they also were uh, an opportunity to bring to bear some of the 
ideas and, and some of the skills that I had picked up from my career as a painter, uh, oil painter in school. The, the way they happened, and the reason I can date them from 1979 so specifically, there is not a Mongo before 1979. <laughs> in the 70s, I was teaching myself to the best of my ability and, and learning as much as I could possibly by watching other people work. I was teaching myself techniques, and I taught my hands pretty well, real well. I, I was, before the Italians showed up on the, on the uh American soil. I, I, I was a pretty good glass. I used to be known as a pretty good glass blower. Well, one of the things that suffered from my skill level by, by training my hands to, to make controlled glass that, that was exactly the way I set out to make it and so on, or almost exactly. One of the downfalls to that was that I had lost some of the spontaneity, some of the fluid, um, dramatically uh, interesting pieces that I had made in the 60s, which actually I figured out later, I figured out that they, they happened because I couldn't control the glass. I was unable. I did not have the skills yet to control the glass to the point that it looks like it come, came out of a mold but was actually free blown. Well, I, I thought that was a good idea, but in, in fact, it, it, was, uh, it was, not, was not me. It was not my personality was not showing up in these pieces. What I needed was to capture some of that earlier spontaneous liquidy movement that happened naturally in the 60s because I couldn't control it. And now in the 70s, I needed to force that to happen. So what I did was go up in scale. I made pieces that were much bigger and heavier than I had the physical control over. And now it was as if I had turned the calendar back 10 years, 15 years, and I was now making things out at the edge again. And guess what? They did show that fluid quality. So when I show slides today, even, even all the way till today, I always tell the story about how important it was that I looked at my own work to see where I was and to tell me where to go next. And many students need to hear, I think, that um, maybe an idea that you had maybe doesn't pan out the way you wanted it to. So you then have the choice of making that change. And so I made that choice very consciously and then, and then grew into that. Other choices that I've made have led me in, in other directions, but um, that one was a, was a major choice. So in 1979, I started two series of the Mongos. One uh, is the series that, that developed out of, in North Carolina, and the other series developed out in uh, Pilchuck in Stanwood, Washington. They're different each from themselves, but they are also uh, similar in the fact that they have that uh, dramatic fluid change. You made wheel carved glass from 1993 to the present. What were your aesthetic goals for that body of work? I can exactly date that in, in, in 93 because that's when I took parts of his class and that's when I first started to work with an engraving lathe. This is a tool that I had seen pictures of but had no earthly idea how to do it until I went to that class in Pilchuck. And what I found that I could do with carving the glass was to create edges, sharp, optically interesting edges that would refract and bend the light and, and make them um, sparkle. It was, it was a takeoff on the kind of glass that my grandmother used to collect. All of our grandmothers probably collected the cut glass from the 19th uh, century and the early 20th century from the so-called brilliant period, uh, identified by the glass historian types. And, and they were very geometrically um, patterned, ornate glass objects, and oftentimes in crystal, but occasionally in colors. 
Well, I'm too much of a colorist to, to work a lot in crystal. I did do some in crystal, but working with the colors opened up another possibility for me. And I started working with a, a few of the rare earths that gave colors which would change their, their dichroic colors that change depending on the wall thickness of the glass. So the thinner glass would be one color, the thicker glass would be another color, but all the glass came out of one furnace. And that was, uh, that was a fun project that I worked on for many years. Uh, that has grown into another series. And the cameos are, in case you're wondering, that they are the end of this story. <laughs> they, are the, they are the latest um, uh, development. And the reason that, that I was attracted to the, to the cameo process is that it requires and, and allows me to utilize my skills as both a glass blower and as a glass uh, uh, carver, cutter, and also as a glass colorist. So um, you need um, very thin layers of very intense color that you can then grind down through to expose from one color to the next and make, you can make pictures, you can make geometric forms, um, you can do all kinds of things with uh, cameos. And uh, that's the newest thing, that's uh, uh, what I've been intrigued by for the last few years, and it's what I've been blowing uh, as much as I can. It, it requires a, a studio with a lot of facility, uh, there are not a whole lot of places where I can do cameos, but uh, I, I enjoyed uh, working both in uh, Texas at uh, West Texas uh, A&M University and at uh, the Toledo Museum Pavilion, uh, Glass Pavilion, where they have the equipment that I need in order to do those uh, cameos. And I'm going to be working at Tacoma Glass uh, Museum uh, this next year, making some more of the, the cameo pieces. The process includes making uh, blanks that are, are like um, a color cup, where the color, instead of being on the inside, which it is in most of color cups, the color is on the outside. And then you can engrave through those colors. Your presence during all of the studio glass movement inspired a passion in you for the history you witnessed. Are you going to write a, a book? I am. Well, it's going to start actually with talking about the, the Toledo workshops, and then it'll evolve into my own uh, history and uh, where I fit in and what I was able to accomplish. So that the, the details will be in the book. And you've, you've also written papers, you've given speeches at Corning Museum of Glass, you've shared the story of the hi history you witnessed in all kinds of different venues throughout your career. And, and the Glass Art Society, um, at the various meetings, I've given many lectures and demos there for the Glass Art Society, which that was one of the ways that we decided back in, in uh, the 70s to um, get together a group of the glass artists, get together for a couple of days, three, three or four days, every year somewhere in the United States, usually where there is a glass presence, and uh, talk about glass and, and listen to each other's stories and lectures and um, watch the demos and, and party. <laughs> in fact, uh, the very first Glass Art Society gathering uh, Mark Pizer, who shares the, my interest in this history, and I were living down there in North Carolina, and we went to the, the director of the Penland School of Crafts in uh, 1970, and we said, you know, we'd really like to get all the glass people together, and, and, and uh, we'd like to come here to the school in the off-season when, when there's not very many students around, and maybe we could do as the ceramics people do when they have their Enseca meetings and, and the weavers have their meetings and the blacksmiths have their meetings and so on. We could do that also. And Bill Brown, I remember, said, uh, I, don't, I don't think so. That's, that's a bad idea. And I said, why, Bill? He said, well, glass blowers are like horseshit. And I said, Bill, what do you mean? He said, well, 
in a great big pile, they stink. But if you spread them out all over the countryside, then they can do some good. <laughs> so I said to Bill, look, let us come together for three days and stink. And then we'll go out and spread the gospel around the country. And he reluctantly said, well, I suppose you're going to do it someplace. So you better do it here so I can keep my eye on it. <laughs> and, and Bill Brown was one of the biggest supporters of the glass activity in America that you can possibly imagine. And he was the first recipient of our uh, honorary uh, title for the Glass Art Society, Bill Brown. So what would you classify as some of the biggest developments or advances in studio glass? Well, they, this, the two questions uh, that I deal with occasionally when I'm doing things like this, one is what are the, what are the, what are the things that got done and what are, where are we going? What's, what's coming next? And they both have uh, almost the same answer that the things that we did that were the best were when people did what was personally important to them. And, and the things that we're going to do in the future that are going to be significant are the things that, that people feel are important to them. So some people feel that glass should be more universally uh, accepted in, in the art world. And they are hoping that that glass will just become another material for artists to work with. And that was really the dream that Littleton had um, back in the 50s, late 50s, and into the uh, 60s. And all of his life was that um, there would be no difference in one material or one media to another. It was just art. It's either art or it ain't art. And that's, um, you don't have to put some, an adjective in front of the word art. It doesn't have to be glass art or clay art or metal art or oil paint art. It could just be art. So I'm, I'm really thinking that um, when people dreamed up their great ideas individually and then the important aspect was the educational part of passing that information and and that excitement on to the next person that's what was that's what made it that's what made this thing fly as big and far and fast as it did and it was fast it it just it just grew exponentially there's something very special about glass artists though because I've been doing this since 1987, and part of why it's still interesting to me is because the people are so fascinating. They're just a great group of people. How do you explain that? There is something. I don't understand it exactly, but I draw the parallel that when we were starting off with the glass, we got support from those ceramics people and from the other media people also but especially from the ceramics people, they, I don't know if they thought we were like their kid brother or, or you know, the, the distant cousin from, from uh, the farm, down on the farm, but somehow they did support what we were doing and, and they, they saw that excitement that we had generated and, and they worked with that. But what I often say is that, that by, in, in the 60s, when we were starting, it was like the pioneers crossing uh, the United States. Well, it wasn't even the United States. It was just crossing the, the continent in the wagon trains. And, and there was a, a feeling that if you took your wagon and went off alone, you'd probably be eaten by bears and wolves and um, attacked by uh, other people and, and so on. But if you stayed together in the wagon train, you could help each other and you could get to your destination. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Talking Out Your Glass. 
Check FritzDreisbach.com for future publications and to find out about his class in Jacksonville, Florida in 2017. If you have questions or comments on this podcast or you're interested in sponsorship opportunities, email me at editor at glassartmagazine.com. Look for my article on Fritz Dreisbach's work in the November-December 2014 issue of Glass Art Magazine, available at www.glassartmagazine.com. Till next time, stay glassy. Down you are.